welcome everybody. Uh, for today's episode, we'll be chatting with Neil Sel Selwyn, who is a distinguished professor in the Faculty of Education at Monash University. Um, an internationally recognized scholar, Neil's research focuses on digital education and technology. Uh, his recent projects explore data and schooling um, and issues such as digital labor, AI technologies, and facial recognition. So welcome, Neil. Thanks for joining us today. No worries. Thanks for having me. Well, we've been reading a lot of your work, um, but for some who may not be as uh, informed about it, could you share a bit about your background and how you ended up as a scholar of educational technology? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I started um, researching this area in 1995. Um, originally, I did a degree in politics and sociology and education as the third bit. And I found that education was um, kind of an easier subject to study at university. So I stuck with education. And it was also a place where you could talk about politics and sociology. Um, and then I got to do a PhD. And I could have done it in any area of kind of education policy. At the time, in 1995, the, the internet was a thing. Uh, and I figured that it might be, might have legs. It might allow me to carry, have a research career. So I just picked ICT and the internet kind of arbitrarily as a way of getting a scholarship to do a PhD. And then I quickly found that um, technology was a really great place to explore kind of any issue that you want to in education and education policy. So I kind of slipped into it in a pragmatic way. Um, and then, yeah, it went from there. And luckily, the internet proved to be a thing. Technologies proved to be durable. And here I am, 27 years later, still doing the same old stuff. But I'm not a techie. I've got no real interest in technology. I did use computers in schools during the 80s when I was a kid, not very satisfactorily. And I think that itch has also sort of uh, kind of pushed me a little bit. I was a bit frustrated with technology at school when I was a kid. Um, but I'm not really techie, not, not a teacher, got no background in teaching at all. I'm just a social scientist, really, just a social researcher. And this is a great area with which to explore contemporary issues. So how would you sort of describe your, your methodological and theoretical orientation to, to studying uh, ed, educational technology or, or ed tech. You've talked a bit about, you know, your interest in sociology and politics and policy. Um, how do you how do you bring those things together in your in your work and your analysis? The way you think about technology. I mean, particularly given the fact that you were saying, "Hey, I'm not a I'm not a techie." I think you even might have just said you have no real interest in technology. So <laughs> maybe you could maybe you could talk about, um, you know, your sort of unique perspective and, and how you study this uh, phenomenon. Uh, well, the thing to say is it's not unique at all. And um, when I started doing the PhD, there were so many other people asking the same questions, pursuing the same interests, arguing about the same issues. A lot of the stuff we're talking about in 2022, uh, whenever you're watching this, is pretty much the same as people were doing in 1992. So it's not unique at all. And actually, I guess my approach is always to look about what critically minded folk are saying about technology outside of education and bringing those issues in. So I'm a little bit of a magpie and pretty pragmatic, and you could argue quite shallow. But the stuff, I mean, the people I was reading back, back in the day were asking some really interesting questions. So Langdon Winner, for example, and the whole kind of, STS of a sort, but not the kind of active network theory, but I kind of picked up on winners, you know, how do artifacts have politics? And I got quite interested in the kind of the social shaping of technology and the social construction of technology, the Scott stuff. And just this idea that you know, this socio-technical, it seems obvious now, and it was kind of obvious to lots of people in the early 90s, but the idea that we're not just talking about technological artifacts, we're talking about the coming together of the social, the economic, the political, the cultural, the historical, and the technical. Uh, and schools are one place where this is kind of writ large. So I was kind of riffing off people like Winner and Neil Postman. Um, and there was a great book actually by Kevin Rob Robbins and Frank Webster in the UK, which was called The Technical Fix. And it was about, I think it was education, computers, and industry. And that really got me interested in the kind of political economy aspect as well. Um, so I guess, yeah, my, my, my take on things is, is quite conventional now, um, and, but it's sort of coming from that socio-technical, um, social construction of technology um, way of thinking. Um, and that's 
now proven to be really, really important. And it's interesting to see that kind of perspective now, kind of mainstream. It's fairly obvious that's how you think about technology now. Back in 1995, when we were talking about you know, the, what was it, the information superhighway and all of these other things, it was, uh, you had to kind of look hard for that kind of, that, that approach. So I would say I'm a critical social scientist, but I'm not critical in the fact that I use, you know, critical theory or I look back to the kind of Frankfurt School, but I do ask the kind of, the, the pro- I try and problematize technology in terms of power, in terms of you know, disadvantage and oppression. I'm very much a kind of taking a conflict approach rather than a consensus approach to, to thinking about the, the digital and education. And you bring up with um, problematizing technology, especially in education, where sometimes it can be taken for granted that, um, that technology will save all the problems of education that are you know, already mired within the structure. In uh, 2016, you had a book that came out is called is technology good for education which is a very provocative question um thinking now six years later i want to maybe pose that question back again to you is technology good for education and then also what are some of its positive applications but then also i think we've seen and you've written about since then what are the dangers of educational technology yeah, no, I would say for first off, I said I was very pragmatic and shallow. When it comes to writing books, I will kind of write anything that people ask me to. So there's a few of the more recent books. The titles have been suggested by the publishers. So I wrote a book called, um, oh, Christ, what was it? Oh, the other thing is I forget everything that I've ever written after, after I've written it. Um, Should Robots Replace Teachers, which is a terrible title. And I really didn't want to write a book called that. That was the publisher's idea because they thought, oh, that was sell. So I actually wrote it about work and ex professional expertise and and AI Um, the question itself you get and the same with is technology good for education that wasn't my idea at all and you can play around with it though because you can argue about you know clearly good is a value-driven statement and it brings in this idea that technology is contested um, and, and, and is ideological and all the rest of it so it was fun to play around with that I clearly don't think technology is good for education at all I think the, the dominant form of ed tech that we have at the moment, I think, is, is just a hellscape of just these huge platforms, Google Classroom, Turnitin, Teams. And we know that they're fundamentally based along logics of kind of extraction, exploitation, individualization, standardization. And they, you can argue that they are just hollowing out. The, the kind of any any hope we have for public education so if i'm being pessimistic which i quite like to be sometimes clearly technology is not good for education and in that book actually we look at the the role of how the corporate corporate interests are coming into education through technology we talk about this idea of democratization and the idea that technology makes education fairer um, there were other chapters as well that were kind of looking at other forms of what you might seem as good um, And so, yeah, in short, no. Um, But on the other hand, I kind of want to get away from talking about technology in terms of good. I mean, there's lots of stuff at the moment about AI for good. Clearly, it it depends on what you mean by good. But also talking about technology as either good or bad is also also a way of kind of avoiding, I think um, David Columbia wrote recently, it's, it's almost a dishonest way of avoiding more tricky questions about you know, class and race and ableism and oppression and um, you know, all, all of the things we should be talking about. So I guess technology is not completely good. It's not completely bad. It's all things in between. Um, and you can find examples of technology that fit your own version of good. So you talk to most ed tech people and they can come up with some you know, technologies. They would say, yeah, this is good for learning. So you'll often hear people say, you know, classroom technologies are very good for students with autism. You know, there's a whole ableist um, argument that you could use to c- contend that. But in terms of lots of people's idea of what good and learning means, yeah, you can point to examples. If you're coming at it from a social justice perspective, similarly, you can point to specific bits of technology or specific programs or initiatives that you could say have had a kind of progressive impact. But what I'm quite interested in is, is, is how any technology that you might say is good is very contextually bounded. It works within a particular local setting for a particular group of students with a particular teacher in a particular community in a particular region. The same technology that you might see as good when applied in another context with another teacher in another community at another time could have completely different kind of consequences. So it's very locally contextually bounded, socially shaped. 
And this is why you can't really talk about scalable, one size fits all solutions, because when technology does work, if it does work at all, it's very, very kind of localized. And so in some ways, yeah, I wrote a book called Is Technology Good for Education? But I'd like to go away from the idea of you know, a kind of homogenized good or a kind of generalizable bad and talk about the wrinkles and you know when technology breaks down and all the rest of it. So I could point you to three or four technologies I might think are good. Um, interestingly, we're talking on the week that Audrey Waters, who is a great public scholar about ed tech, she's just a renounced education technology. She had a blog post last week saying, you know, this is it, I'm, I'm done. And the thing that she was saying tipped her over the edge was there was one software application that she would always say is this is the really good idea about technology i forget the name of it now but it was a startup and a kind of like an app and and it just pivoted and i think they just sold it to venture capitalists and she said my god this is the one thing i was saying was good in their tech and this has let me down so I'm, I'm very wary of saying, oh, okay, the Raspberry Pi, for example, is an amazing example of technology. But yeah, there are things that you and I and Alex could point to that we would say are good. Yeah, they are. But as a whole, I think technology is the, the dominant form of excessive ed tech that we currently have is, is not good for us and will not be good for us. Well, going with that, because you're bringing it up, because I know it's that because this Good is such a problematic word, and it has, and as you said, it's very locally and contextually bounded, especially with technology. I'm curious, why do you think this idea that technology is good per se is such a seductive mythology within education? Well, I mean, it's a seductive kind of discourse throughout technology, I think, throughout society. And in some ways, the whole idea of say AI for good or technology for good, it shows the progression amongst the kind of technicist computer science classes, if you want to kind of label them like that, that they're beginning to grapple with social issues. So you could argue, you know, 20 years ago, and no, that's not fair because there were some really good <laughs> discussions in the 70s about AI and society by the likes of Joseph Witzenbaum and everybody else. But you could argue that there's the, the, now a general consensus in the tech classes and the IT industry that, you know, technology has social consequences and they need to think about the, the, the ramifications of, of the, um, the technologies that are being developed. But the seeing that solely in terms of for good still retains this kind of solutionist mentality that there are problems that can be addressed, that can be solved. And so the idea of for good kind of implies that technology is, is solving. So this, this techno solutionist mindset, I think, drives this attraction of, of for good. And also for good is a very kind of broad brush way of dealing with questions of ethics and morals and, you know, fairness and the rest of it that are really difficult for anyone to grapple with, let alone people that have not really talked about it. And it makes you feel nice. And I think um, Ben Green wrote a really good paper about data science for good in, the, in, the, in 2018, where they were arguing that it, it, it allows you to kind of feel good about the work you're doing. It allows you to actually kind of, um, you know, justify um, development of technology, but in ways that don't really engage with politics and engage in ways that really kind of gloss over a lot of more problematic issues that can't be codified and programmed and addressed in technical ways. Um, and, and politicians like it, it's a good slogan. Um, and, and it's not just an educational thing, but educators are picking up on it in the way that they always pick up on technological trends five, 10 years later. So in some ways we do need to push back against the idea of tech for good, but we don't want to dissuade people that have engaged with it, that you know, there, there is a kind of question here about values and morals and, and social outcomes, because that's clearly what we want people to be thinking. Yeah, and the, the techno solutionist, mentality is one of obviously techno fixes for multifaceted social, ethical, political problems that require sort of uh, multifaceted responses. Um, and it's interesting that you say that you think that more and more tech people are um, thinking about these kinds of issues and, and recognizing the limitations of their own thinking in relation to technology. Um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more on that, but there, and you've touched on this point a little bit already, but there have, there's a history of sort of wild predictions uh, concerning computerization and automation of education that go back a long way. And 
you, you know, you could probably talk about the 1980s and the 1990s, but certainly 10 years ago, um, there was a kind of an explosion of predictions and discourses about how, um, you know, the internet of things and sort of web 2.0 and, um, you know, artificial intelligence and the rest of it are gonna fundamentally remake K-12 education, higher education. And I'm curious, um, you know, what is your perspective on how these predict predictions have panned out um, in relation to where things stand today? Um, I'm thinking here about sort of the peak Silicon Valley prior to sort of, you know, the election of Trump in 2016. Um, you know, after that, there's sort of, uh, it, it sort of pierced the bubble of, of, of Silicon Valley, I don't know, hype um, in relation to the revelations around Facebook and privacy and, and all the rest of it. So in terms of educational technology, how, how, how have some of those predictions that were, that were present in 2014, 2015, how have those things sort of panned out in relation to where things are today? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Actually, just going back to the first thing you said about thinking about the social in, in, te in technology circles, it's really interesting to think about, I mean, the effect that someone like kind of Dimnit Gabru and, and the whole hurrah around um, natural language processing and being fired from Google and the rest of it. There are people working within tech companies who are really kind of critically minded and are far more anthropological and sociological and philosophical than, than, than any of us. So there are some really kind of clever people working inside the belly of the beast I think so in, in terms of people now feel that they recognize that they have to start thinking along these ways even if it's not the way they're thinking what's interesting about people in tech thinking about the social which I think is happening you don't see many people in ed tech think, knowing about or thinking about education it's really interesting how a curious people are in ed tech about what education is actually like um I saw some claims recently that the, you know, the fact that lots of teachers are resigning is an opportunity now for ed tech firms to employ them, which is just a terrible, heinous kind of way of reading the situation. But they don't have many educators or people that actually care about education or know about education working for ed tech. So people are thinking about socialists. I think also there's a need for ed tech firms to think about educational issues because education is such a kind of complex social um, kind of setting um, that requires a lot more thinking about. Anyway, on to the second bit of the question about the hype in the 2000s. There's always been hype about technology, as you said, in education since the 70s, 80s, 90s. What was different in the 2000s, I think, as you hint at, in the 2010s, was that it was driven by not just Silicon Valley, but this kind of venture capitalist, angel investor type, you know, bubble in the US, in North America, at least. Um, what's interesting now is how perhaps if you're looking towards the ed tech hype of the 2020s, you want to look towards India, for example. You know, the biggest ed tech firm is now Indian, not from North America. People are quite interested in what's going on in Southeast Asia in general not just China, but other kind of large, large markets. So the hype is continuing, but in different ways outside of the kind of the Anglo Western sort of sphere that we tend to be immersed in. But that kind of 2010s hype, 2000s hype was very much driven by dollars and profit and just ed tech bubbles. And it wasn't the only one, you know, people were getting very excited about FinTech and MedTech and AdTech. So ed tech wasn't unique, but there was a moment where people thought, yep, education, we can make money from this. Um, the hype clearly was was hype. So the MOOC hype, for example, where as soon as MOOCs pivoted from um, X MOOC, sorry, C MOOCs to X MOOCs, so from constructivist MOOCs, the kind of hippie George Seaman, Stephen Dan's idea of open knowledge networks and co-construction, to the very corporatized X MOOC of Coursera and you know um, the rest of it, driven by the likes of Sebastian Thrun. They were clearly, you know, this is the future of higher education in 30 years time, there'll only be 10 universities left, blah, blah, blah. You could argue none of that has come to fruition. But when you talk to the folk that were pushing that hype 10 years ago, they were very much, I guess, pushing the long game. And they would argue that, you know, the pivot during the pandemic in higher education to online learning and online courses was very much facilitated by the, the shock of the MOOC in the early 2010s. You know, it forced universities to just pay attention to online learning, not the forms of online learning necessarily that were being pushed through the MOOC discourse, but you know, there was a shift of the dial towards taking online seriously and the idea of mass provision seriously. They would also point to the fact that some of the boom in learning analytics and the datafication of education has come true. So clearly there's not been a whole 
shift in the market of education. We still have public institutions. We haven't got kind of, you know, massive monolith ed tech firms that are kind of running education in the way that perhaps being predicted. And I don't think many people are making a huge profit from their ed tech products. And we've seen spectacular pivots and spectacular failures. You know, Alt School, for example, is a great salutary lesson about um, the, the hubris that was around in the 2010s. Newton, you know, with a K, K-E-N-W. The rubbish that was being talked there about Newton as a recommender system um, just hasn't come to fruition. But on the other hand, we still have personalised learning systems. So some of the logics have become a little bit more mainstream. Some of the assumptions... So the underpinning kind of shift, I think, is slow. And they would argue that, yeah, it's too early to tell, you know, come back to us in 2052, not 2022, to see what's happened. But of course, that wasn't what was being said at the time. It was going to be quick, a quick win, a massive transformation and a revolution. So there's incremental change that you can point to over the past 10 years um, and, and possibly in 30, 40 years time. Some of the more wild stuff they were talking about might come to some form of fruition. So, yeah, I would take the long perspective on it. I wouldn't be kind of congratulating ourselves that, oh, yeah, you know, that was all a load of rubbish and none of it came true. I think some quite dangerous precedents have been put into train, particularly in the minds of policymakers, education leaders, and other people that kind of have a say in what education could be. If you look at some of the rubbish that was being talked about by Kiyomo, was it, how you say it? Kumu, the, the, the New York governor, when they were talking about ripping up the blueprint for New York schools and having a kind of a reef, a reset of New York schools. And they brought in Eric Schmidt and Bill Gates and a whole bunch of other people to talk about what they could do with K-12 in New York. Some of the logics that were being taken seriously by elected politicians and elected officials were straight out of the 2010 EdTech hype rule book. And that's worrying that the, the ideas are still being taken seriously. So I don't think we're out of the out of the weeds yet. Well, from from what you're saying, it sounds like um, the air has really been let out of the balloon in a lot of ways. Um, it's it's persisting. It's still kind of floating around. It still has like a little bit of helium left. It's kind of floating, but there's but but it's um, you know the the extensiveness of the hype is sort of dissipated. I mean, what from the standpoint of like the big players in the market, um, Apple, Google, um, Microsoft, Meta, but you also mentioned India and China, which is interesting. So maybe you, we could also include um, state funding of, of technological research in this too, maybe even, you know, China, for instance. I mean, what are the sort of emergent developments and innovations that are being discussed um, that might have some likelihood of, of actually coming to fruition? Like what, what are the discussions like um, uh, um, and, and the innovations that are sort of emerging? Uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, the Indian example is interesting because there's a lot of money there um, in terms of um, the, the companies that are coming on stream because India is such a huge market. Um, so the interest say in India, for example, is you've got a huge population of students that are being seen to be not served at all by public education, let alone being underserved. So you've got companies like Byju's, B-Y-J-U apostrophe S, which is a huge multi-billion dollar, and it's valued at $22 billion. And they claim to have, you know, 115 million registered students. And it's very much based around this logic of private tutoring and, you know, the tech firms stepping in where there is no provision. And um, so I think online tutoring, um, particularly to underserved and, and non-served um, populations is a logic which clearly through the pandemic we saw coming to the fore in terms of even, you know, in countries like Australia, middle-class families suddenly, suddenly pivoting to online services to supplement what they saw as kind of mediocre public education fair. So I think this idea of there being a kind of shadow marketplace or a marketplace outside of the school system uh, and the university system um, is certainly coming to the fore. And that's a logic that we should take very, very seriously. There was a kind of interest that China had banned private tutor, online private tutoring companies last year, which I think is tied up much more in the politics of, of China and tech rather than any particular concern over the well-being of students. And I'm very wary about you know, this kind of um, sinophilia where we, we, we look towards China as some kind of extreme version of dystopian or utopian technology. The logics of what's going on in China started in North America, started in Silicon Valley. You know, so we're talking about surveillance of students through facial recognition, 
Um, that didn't start in China, that's taking place all around the world. So to kind of other um, what's going on in China or India is a bit of a trap in a way. But certainly like mass online private tutoring, Khan Academy on steroids, I think I would take that very seriously. What's interesting about a lot of the stuff that critically minded scholars are talking about at the moment, so there's this idea of, you know, synthetic governance or AI driven, you know, decision making and the rest of it in the classroom is how much of it is actually vaporware or what we would have called in the 2000s, 2000s vaporware. I'm a bit skeptical about how much of this stuff actually A is feasible and B is actually happening and it is actually present. And there's a danger we get a little bit distracted by these socio-technical imaginaries which are being pushed by tech firms about education. They kind of distract our attention from you know, the very real present dangers and the very real present ways that technologies have been used in classrooms. So I, I'm like Lee Vincell, <clears throat> who's an SDS scholar um, from the States, talks about critty hype. And what he says, he refers to as lending credibility to industry bullshit. So every time we suddenly start talking about what possibly could be the worst thing about having education in the metaverse, we're actually adding helium and pumping up the metaverse balloon and hyping it up. Whereas really, we should be talking about some of the more heinous things that are being done with actually existing technology. So if I'm going to talk about AI, I would like to talk um, what Siddharth refers to as actually existing AI rather than this imagined AI and perhaps move away from what could happen to what is happening. But I mean, certainly data, automation, platformatization, those are things that are happening and we should be talking about. Um, and, and in a way, those logics can be traced back to the hype of 10, 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, this idea of, uh, of, of, of critty hype, I think, is worth taking seriously. So, yep, let's look at India. Let's look at China. Let's look at what's actually taking place, where the money, where money's actually being pumped in and actually being made. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff still to be worried about. So what you're saying is that we're all going to be pulling a lever if, in a virtual factory in the metaverse so that we can earn Bitcoin uh, to survive. Is that, exactly. is that what you're saying? Exactly. The trouble is, whenever you say anything, so even if you start saying anything, all, all people hear is education and the metaverse or education and Bitcoin. So it's really dangerous to start kind of wildly to even engage with some of this speculation. I, I mean, I'm only on Wikipedia, I think, once, and that's to do with digital natives. And I wrote a piece years ago saying, you know, there's so much bullshit about digital natives and we need to debunk it. The bit that was read was, Digital natives is a description of young people being great at technology. And that's what got picked up. <laughs> so there is a danger that as soon as you say pulling a lever and pushing in Bitcoin, people go, oh, yeah, that could possibly happen. And then people just the, the promotion goes on and on and on. At the same time, we've got mass terrible use of you know, online exam proctoring and software, which is really discriminatory and really kind of horrible that people don't even look at because it's not the metaverse and it's not Bitcoin. So you're right. We need to kind of roll back a bit. And I think look at the ways technologies are actually being used. And most importantly, look at the ways that technology don't work. The technologies we have in their tech at the moment, a lot of them do not work and are not capable of doing what's claimed to be that they're doing. And that's a real harm. If we're going to talk about social harms, I think what technology doesn't do, can't do, and, and, and isn't capable of doing. So if you, if you have a system in a school now that allegedly gives you feedback on students' motivation or engagement or emotional state, that's clearly bullshit and it, it can't happen. But the, it, there was a great quote, I forget the name, I forget the name of the guy who said it, I'll have to kind of put it in the notes, but whether or not a technology is capable of doing what it's claimed to be doing isn't, isn't the problem, it's whether someone believes that it can. Adam Greenfield, that was right, Adam Greenfield. And if you've got education managers and administrators and leaders thinking, oh, yeah, this is just a quick way of, you know, getting around the fact that we, we can't monitor our students' engagement states and you put in a kind of really crappy AI system that can't really do it, but it just ticks the box, then it gets implemented and all of the social harms that accrue from it happen. So we need to talk about ed tech not working, ed tech failing, what ed tech isn't doing, what ed tech isn't capable of. Rather than, as you say, you know, I, don't, I, I doubt we'll ever see the metaverse in our lifetime, Alex, so I, I won't be mm -hmm. seeing you there. Um, there's a lot of flim flammery um, here in Hawaii and in some other states in the U.S. too. I have a daughter in elementary school, so when the pandemic started and, and the lockdown became a reality, parents were offered to have their kids go like to a fully online program, a fully digital program. And 
within we did which we did not choose we chose like zoom lessons with the teacher and in fact we sent her to a nature camp every day is what we actually ended up doing so we're privileged enough to have the ability to do that um but but the point i want to make is that this digital program that the state of hawaii contracted for was called a cellus and within a couple of months parents it was basically like kids watch a little video and they answer like these little questions. And that's like, that was basically it. That's the whole thing. Like this canned curriculum, these like little videos, like shoddily produced, no production, no production value and no intellectual um, content like whatsoever. Um, but even deeper, even deeper than just it being, um, you know, shallow and vapid and empty, um, parents started sharing screenshots of content from these videos that had I mean, overtly racist overtones. And then parents started asking questions. Well, where is this stuff coming from? And it turns out that this entire program was developed by this guy who has a kind of polygamous, um, he, he, he's sort of the, the founder of like a kind of cult, a polygamous cult. And he was having what he called his celestial wives. I'm, I'm not making this up. His celestial wives were the people largely in charge of making the content for this online program. No one had any credential, you know, no one had studied education or thought very deeply about education or, or anything like this. And it just, it seems so symptomatic to me, this, this, this particular example of just, you know, the flim flammery and um, quackery um that that really it, it's not just at this level it, it runs all the way through through the the chain and until you get to like elon musk um etc cetera, etc cetera. um but okay so i i i i, I want to shift gears just just a little bit um so we're not going to be pulling a le lever in a di digital factory in the metaverse or at least it's not likely that we will be um but I am interested in, in the connection between education and work. And I would really like to hear your thoughts on just a couple of things. So, you know, if you look at McKinsey, you look at um, World Economic Forum, you look at some of these like international policy agenda setting organizations in terms of their publications and what they've been saying about the reorganization of work, the reor reorganization of education. A lot of it is about, um, yeah, using uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence um, to break apart the structure of education and to um, sort of dissolve the boundaries between learning and work, um, especially through the idea of sort of temporary contract. Every worker becomes a kind of temporary contractor or gig worker. Um, education becomes about like very specified training for specific kinds of micro credentials and badges. And then you have sort of like skills databases that can match up particular workers to particular gigs. And this is sort of the future of the economy, the future of education, the future of livelihoods. I mean, is there anything to um, any of those uh, sort of predictions? Um, I'd just be curious to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's certainly something to the gig economy and precarious labour and the whole precarity of being a young person going into the labour market. So, I mean, that's certainly happening. Um, whether you think that's a positive thing or not, I, I, I would take possibly another angle on that. But, I mean, so the, the whole just-in-time logic and micro-credentials and badging and all of that's been around for a long time. The idea of unbundling um, the education system has been a kind of dream of the kind of corporate reformers for a long, long time. So in some ways, they're just picking up on you know, trends in the labour market and spinning it to kind of re, re put more helium into an old agenda. You know, the, the, the demonopolisation of public education and, you know, this idea of a marketplace and diversity and choice and 100 providers and all of that. So those logics run deep. I think it's not just a kind of 2020s new economy thing. Um, and I certainly think we need to be looking beyond McKinsey and the World Economic Forum and OECD for our ideas about education technology, which is actually why UNESCO, I've been doing bunches of stuff with UNESCO recently, and they're very up for, or some of them are very up for talking about the, the dark side of education technology. So we need to shine more of a light on those things. And, and again, same. I'm not criticising you, but yeah, every time we say McKinsey say this or WEF says that, we're feeding the 
the bullshit even more. So maybe we should just never look at that stuff again and assume that it's it's not for good. So I think precarious labour is happening. What I'm interested in is how actually the education system is being retweaked to kind of feed the the, the kind of the non-glamorous, non-sexy side of precarity and the gig economy. So yeah, you can argue we can give students the smarts to kind of you know hustle their way through life and you know, have just in time training the rest of it on the flip side we've got some quite pernicious things coming in to just basically you know give fodder for, for for the precarious economy so this whole idea of resilience and grit and making people individually strong to kind of survive terrible working conditions i think that's something that really needs to be kind of looked at in the rise of mindfulness in schools and all of these kind of individualized neoliberal ways of coping with the trauma of working in those conditions or not working in those conditions i think needs to be looked at technology is coming also coming to this idea of digital entrepreneurship particularly in the global south if you look what's going on in in kind of low to middle income countries the idea that you know digital entrepreneurship can give otherwise you know unconnected people a leg up to become kind of you know successful individual hustlers in in the digital economy wherever they may live that's really dangerous as well so like you can flip it on and hopefully that we, in a minute, we can talk about decoupling ed tech from ed, ed, economic growth altogether. So the idea that ed tech and economic growth go ha hand in hand needs to be challenged, particularly in terms of kind of environmental and ecological change. But I'm also interested in the way that we might rethink education. What would an education look like that would really support young people to survive or even thrive in precarious um, conditions? So, for example, um, the idea of unionizing people working for uber or you know kind of working in crappy jobs getting some kind of collective consciousness and some kind of organized labor how can we use technology perhaps to kind of encourage that form of thinking or those forms of connections how can we kind of help young people think more critically about the algorithmic governance of their work if they are in any of these jobs you know the idea of thinking what the app is actually nudging you to do or pushing you to do or the way that your work is being algorithmically kind of constrained. How can we kind of make young people think critically about bossware and other forms of surveillance that's taking place through digital devices when they're working through an app? So there are quite interesting ways of thinking about maybe a kind of critical work, digital studies, which um, would be would be super interesting. But yeah, the idea of micro credentials and, you know, um, the rest of it fitting with precarious labour, I can, yeah. I can see those logics kind of fitting into the way that technology is used in work-based training and perhaps in higher education. My one hope is actually that schools, K-12, are remarkably resilient to a lot of this flim flammery, for, for better and for worse. Um, so I think school curricula changing um, in, in those ways is going to be more difficult. And that's actually a fight that we might be able to engage in and possibly, not, if not win, at least have some success in because you know schools change so slowly the idea of having a micro credentialed nano curriculum in hawaii i think would take at least 20 years to get it through and that's maybe we can slow things down and then maybe kind of interrupt those sorts of discourses at a more kind of local regional level i like how you said too like instead of thinking about what can a tech do why are we not talking about what's the dark side of that tech, especially I always think about reading when I was reading your work is how aware are students of how much AI is already infiltrating their classrooms, right? You know, what you have listening devices, you know, AI doesn't mean you have a robot in the classroom. It means that there's these algorithms that are collecting the data and how much you know, agency does a student have to protect their privacy within these spaces. And I'm curious too with, um, is you have a recent article, but also thinking about how maybe the COVID-19 pandemic has or maybe not in, has not impacted ed tech. Maybe it has shown that there are these dark sides to ed tech, you know, maybe a facial recognition showing that it is based on racist algorithms. Um, so you have the COVID-19 pandemic impacting ed tech, but almost maybe how has it shown maybe what the limits are of ed tech? Yeah, I mean, COVID's interesting um, and carries on to be interesting. I'm convinced we're not post-pandemic at the moment. We're still in the middle of it. Uh, but it was, it was on the one hand, was 
a, a lifesaver for lots of people because education could carry on in some form. So I'm not stupid enough to say, you know, let's go back to completely analog. But it was remote emergency schooling, remote emergency education. So the ed tech folk, a lot of them would say, well, that wasn't an example of what ed tech is. The ed tech's way more better than that and better designed. You know, this was a very kind of basic version of what we had. But on the other hand, you had the industry and the, you know, the kind of investors seizing on this opportunity to be, this is the moment that everyone pivots away from schools. And of course, I think what most countries have seen in, in the global north, at least, is that people are super happy to go back to schooling, K-12 schooling, exactly as it was before. We don't want any mention of anything changing because we value that day-to-day -day daycare. So Alex doesn't have to send his kids off to nature camp and, you know, the, the teachers can carry on doing what they're doing. And in a way, the K-12 sector has learned or changed very little, which you could argue is a good thing, that we've rediscovered the value of public education and we're... Not sure really that's the case, but there's been less of a shift there. Where the shifts I think have occurred in the K-12 space is this whole push for um, consumer ed tech. So not, not, not for schools, but for parents and for you know, middle-class families like mine that you know, suddenly value the need of having your know, online education as, a, as an extra. So I think the ed tech markets have quickly worked out that they can't sell more stuff to schools but they can start selling stuff to the domestic market, to the, the parents that can afford it and are engaged. So that's that's one shift. And the other shift, I think, is in higher education. I think higher education is tipping over pragmatically, because even now, you know, getting all those valuable, lucrative international students back onto campus is still a problem. So you need to still make money from them. So we're turning toward more online ways and the idea of hybrid or high flex learning. So I can see higher education changing fairly substantially over the next 10 years with COVID just giving it a kick, but that kick was already in place. I think as I inferred earlier, the, the MOOC scare, for example, and everything that happened after that kind of set education on its way. So COVID just accelerated or amplified or shone light on a lot of already existing logics, particularly then in terms of the massive digital inequalities that there were in remote schooling. So for every Alex and me that were sending our kids to, you know, great online tutorials that were run by, you know, real life people, there were other families that had three or four kids learning off a smartphone. And you can't, that, the quality of what you can do in, in those two different situations is completely different. Now, some people were shocked when they saw those sorts of reports, but that stuff has been going on for 20, 30 years. It wasn't that suddenly we had digital inequalities, but suddenly, School districts and ed tech firms realize that not everyone has broadband access, not everyone has a device, not everyone, you know, has the time or the, you know, the, the kind of the home life to be able to support that. So that was a bit of a wake up call. And then, of course, there's all the stuff that was going on in the global south and middle and low income countries and their experience of the, of the pandemic and how technology played a role was completely different. Uh, and that's another fascinating story. So. Yeah, COVID wasn't quite the kind of ed tech pivot that some people were trying to kind of profit from. Um, and, and in some ways, the fact that schools have so quickly gone back to, to normal um, is both possibly a concern, but in a way also something that perhaps we could be a bit reassured by, that there is value in face-to-face -face public education where people sit down with a person who knows them and they have conversations. Things that you've turned your attention to and you also write about the pandemic in this context too, which is the environmental crisis, um, the ecological crisis. Um, and you've written a piece called Ed, Ed Tech Within Limits. Um, so we wanted to ask you a couple of questions about that, but also some of, you know, dive, you know, dive into some of the problems that you identify with Ed Tech, but then also ask, ask a question or two about the alternatives that you that you identify. So, so the first question is really, what are the ways in which ed tech actually contributes to the environmental crisis? Um, that, that, was, that was an aspect of that article that I found quite interesting and perhaps a lot of people don't really necessarily consider or have thought about. Yeah, no, so I'm, I'm, this is what I'm writing around at the moment. And so that paper was just an initial um, kind of dip into the, into the issue. I've done a few other things since. And so I've kind of, this is an embarrassing area really, because I'm kind of changing my ideas all the time. So that EdTech Within Limits was an initial thing. 
I've got quite interested in issues of degrowth and eco justice since then. And eventually I'll kind of have a, a, a kind of proper idea. But I don't know, I'm becoming increasingly frustrated or interested in the fact that even progressive, critically minded, climate aware ed tech people like ourselves, I guess, have this weird kind of disavowal that digital technology has got anything to do with the problems. Yeah, we're all very keen on cutting our carbon footprint or, you know, not eating meat or, you know, the, the, the perils of mining and all the rest of it. But digital technology, we don't really see as part of the problem. So I think there is a growing acceptance um, that digital technology can't go on in its current kind of abundant, cornucopian, excessive form. Um, Bitcoin, and there's, we, we realize actually that cryptocurrency is hugely damaging to the environment. I think um, Bitcoin itself is estimated to use the energy consumption of a country like Thailand or Norway. So it's the kind of 13th or 14th most consuming country in the world of energy, just to have something as crappy as Bitcoin. Now, that's an extreme example. But most, if not all other forms of technology are implicated in environmental and ecological um, devastation and destruction. So training a decent deep learning AI model now um, at the levels and the size that deep learning models are now being trained at, is, I think is estimated to be about $100 billion of, of resource, the equivalent carbon footprint of New York City in a month. So clearly carrying on with AI is environmentally possibly unsustainable. Carrying on with this idea of everything being in the cloud and this idea of always on, constantly streaming, you know, all the rest of it, which education has bought into massively, also has huge environmental costs. The cloud is not ephemeral. We know about data centers. Data centers incur huge amounts of energy consumption, huge amounts of water consumption, take up huge amounts of land and the rest of it, they're an environmental disaster. And even small level things like the production of the laptop or the smartphone or the third or fourth device that we have incur all sorts of issues in terms of mineral consumption, rare metals, rare materials, the way that these things are mined. I think 80% of the energy consumption of a laptop is actually takes place in its production. So in terms of the production of these things, we can't carry on just mining lithium. Lithium is not a kind of, uh, a kind of um, in finite, infinite resource. And then there's all the issues around the energy consumption um, of the actual use of these technologies. And then there's all the issues around e-waste and, and all the rest of it. So put these things together, digital technology, you could argue, is not a sustainable thing in the medium to long term. I, in 30, 40 years, the idea of you know, having three devices and constantly streaming might be as socially unacceptable as smoking in the workplace. We might just look at people and what the hell are we doing <laughs> being on our smoke? So all of that is a thing and i think we need to get our heads around that and it's not just a thing for education clearly it's a thing for all of society but educate i work in education so i'm going to talk about ed tech but if i was working in any other sector i'd talk about that as well we need to think seriously about those issues if we're working in ed tech and a lot of our work a lot of your work and my work actually perpetuates this idea that we need to use technology so even the stuff i do in digital inequality the conclusion is, well, we need to make sure that more people can have use of technology. So I'm actually saying we need technology. And even as I said before, when you start kind of engaging with talk about the metaverse, you're actually hyping the idea of these things taking place. So I'm beginning to think that I am the baddie. Um, is it in Reddit? Are, are you the arsehole? Maybe I am not a part of the, the solution here. I'm part of the problem. My work, even though I'm critical about technology, is feeding this thing. So perhaps we need to pivot and think about if technology is going to carry on contributing to the environmental crisis, climate collapse, whatever you want to call it, should we be rethinking our ways of engaging with technology and education? So moving away from this idea of an excessive, abundant, more technology, the better, to more limited or scarce forms of, of technology use and engagement. And that's where this idea of computing within limits comes in, which is a kind of a long running thing in, in, in computer science circles. Rethinking technology and digital technology for times of scarcity, for times of limit, and what might that mean? And that raises a whole bunch of interesting questions about what forms of ed tech we might want to be desiring or think are, are, are useful, what forms of ed tech we might want to be starting pulling back from, and how we can imagine a kind of a new phase of technology that doesn't involve 
more tech, more streaming, more cloud-based um, uh, kind of you know, storage and the rest of it. And that's something that we're not really used to doing. So the compute, the ed tech within limits was uh, the beginning of that. And I'm also getting really interested in this idea of, of degrowth, the idea of voluntary simplicity and slowing down, minimalizing resources for maximal benefit. And if you think about technology in those ways, it's really interesting. It gets you to back to this, what we said at the beginning about values. I was actually first prompted to think about this at my university in Australia. We had a load of bushfires. The data centers began heating up and we had a, a, an email sent around from our university saying, we're not gonna have data storage for the next few days and we're gonna have brownouts. So make sure you only have a central use of technology within the university. And that got me thinking, what the hell is essential about the technology I'm using? Where would essential technology use be within the university? Is it the science department? Is it the, uh, the, the climate change modeling? Is it me doing my kind of rubbish uploading papers to Google Scholar? Probably not. Next year, we have a heart hospital built on campus. So if they're going to use tech anywhere, I'd probably prefer they do it in the heart. But it makes you think if, if technology is finite, where do we put it? So the degrowth idea is really interesting because it's not saying no technology at all. But when you couple it with ideas of eco-justice, it's about using the finite amount of technologies we might have for the most socially just purposes. So rather than just getting rid of technology altogether, maybe we should just begin to concentrate on more environmentally friendly forms of technology that are most useful for those disadvantaged communities that haven't had access to technology so far. So developing ed tech for global south communities, for example, or minoritized communities in the global north, rather than piling 200 laptops into a very privileged middle class school and getting everyone to second screen at the same time. So it's those sorts of thoughts that I'm beginning to play around with. At the same time, I also think we need to engage seriously with the more mainstream argument, oh, there's going to be a technical fix, you know, Google have got it sorted, they're going to have environmentally friendly cloud, they're going to have, you know, better forms of AI modelling, and actually online education can be an environmental saviour, it can decrease the carbon footprints of university campuses, online learning, blah, 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 the rest of it. I don't buy into that at all. But I think we need to really scrutinize what that actually means, how that's taking place and whether it is having an effect. Maybe we all need to go online for the good of the environment. Um, I don't think we do. So we need to kind of pursue all of these different possible futures. You know, the environmental dystopian future where we don't, we've run out of silicon chips and we have to think about what we do with a finite amount of technology. Or we have this more green, clean, lean form of, of ed tech that is environmentally you know, helpful. Either way, but whatever we do, we have to start engaging with it, not just assuming that, you know, ed tech's going to carry on, even if the planet is dying and burning up around us. Yeah, well, that's a nice way to, to finish, isn't it? <laughs> well, it kind of, you kind of um, worked your way through a couple of our, our like, final questions and, and the response that you just gave. Um, but I'm curious to ask you, so you're into this, I mean, I mean, I'm just picked up a couple of books to think more about the the tensions between sort of eco-socialist narratives and degrowth narratives. Um, the eco-socialists kind of tend to say the degrowth people are, are, are more liberal and they're not thinking deep enough about political economy. The eco-socialists have specific ideas that are more about collective ownership of production, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, at least in this one article that you wrote, you don't get into that kind of fine grained, you know, detail about um, supporting one kind of blueprint of political economy that can take us to that better future that you're talking about, as opposed to the dystopian one. But maybe you could talk a little bit about what, and, and I think you write about this in the article. I mean, I think it's kind of there, like what would need to happen? Um, what kind of, what kind of energies, capacities, mindsets, um, movements perhaps are, are necessary to begin producing a new set of trajectories along along that line, uh, along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm beginning to just to try and work my way through the degrowth literature and the eco-justice literature and the eco-socialist literature as well. Um, and, and it is tricky because, oh, well, I can go on about this for hours. Um, there's a great book I've just read by Jonathan Crary called um, Scorched Earth. And he, he takes a very, very kind of bleak um, prognosis that we just need to burn it all down, that there can be no digital commons, there can be no digital solution. We need to just get rid of the digital altogether. 
Uh, and if we fool ourselves that anything digital is going to be part of a habitable future or a kind of survivable planet, then we're fooling ourselves. So that's a very nihilist way of thinking about it. And I'm kind of quite attracted to that as a pessimist. But I want to retain a hope that we, technology has a, has a place. Hence taking the kind of green, you know, eco growth um, perspective seriously. The degrowth stuff's interesting because, in some ways, degrowth is, is, is uh, the, the idea of a digital degrowth is antithetical. For a lot of degrowth folk, the digital has no place here in degrowth thinking whatsoever. Um, but a lot of it also comes down to kind of people like Ivan Illich. So they talk a lot about convivial tools, for example, and the idea of commoning and, and the idea of care and the idea of collective autonomy. So in some ways, there are some principles in some forms of the degrowth literature that I think do chime with this idea of eco-justice, the idea that we need to see the environmental crisis as a humanitarian and a social crisis and therefore deal with it in social and humanitarian ways. So I think there are points where people are meeting together and it is very much based around principles, I think, of, of thinking about technology both as a kind of finite resource that needs to be governed and managed and engaged with on a collective basis, on a kind of commons basis, a more cooperative form of, of, of technology, um, not production necessarily, but sustaining it in ways that draw upon um, ideals of kind of repair and reuse and re, you know, not necessarily recycling, but this idea of of, of making do with what we've got. So I like this idea of principles of, of some form of, of communal um, ownership and communal engagement with, with, with technology, the idea of a kind of a local commons, local technology that's produced along appropriate technology lines. Um, again, there's, there's kind of lines you can draw there back to the kind of thinking in the 70s about um, technology and the environment. And just kind of getting people to rethink what the digital is. There are other forms of digital technology around. It doesn't all have to be a kind of $2,000 MacBook Air. There are quite interesting experiments with mini computers or single board computers, you know, the, the Raspberry Pi, for example. There are kind of local mesh Wi-Fi grids and kind of more anarchist forms of technology that are much more based around um, yeah, kind of more activist ways of thinking about technology. So I'm not saying we need to go back to the land and kind of or go back to kind of off grid, um, low forms of tech use. But there are other ways of thinking about technology, perhaps even just as a communal shared resource, the idea of individually owning a laptop that only you can use when you want we need to get over that. So I think there are many cracks within the kind of the hyper capitalist forms of tech that education is currently brought into that we might pursue. So in the immediate term, you might want to think about collective digital resource libraries, for example. You might want to think about getting cultures of reuse and repair into schools and universities uh, and also into tech companies. And then you might want to start thinking about, you know, other forms of, of more radical slowing down and, and simplicity, but also focusing our attention if you are going to be innovating uh, on forms of tech use that are genuinely you know, leading to fairer, better forms of life for people who are otherwise disadvantaged. So I haven't got any answers whatsoever. If I did, I wouldn't be here at all. I'd be you know, off making a million dollars, getting venture capitalism funding to do it. But these are just questions. I think saying these things out loud is really important because most of us know it, but most of us haven't really got a vocabulary to start thinking about it or talking about it. And we also need to make connections between the education technology communities and climate communities and degrowth communities and eco-socialist communities and tech communities. And, you know, start, we, it's not our problem to work out for ourselves. We need to do it on. But one thing I would finish on, when I started to talk about this, most people in education say, oh, but it's not our fault. It, you know, it's to do with Bitcoin. It's to do with, you know, Google. It's to do with mining companies and big tech and you know, airlines. It's not why pick on education. I'm not picking on education at all. I'm only talking about education because I work in education. I think education has, it's, it's not just our responsibility, but it's not just anyone else's. It's all of our responsibility. It has to be a global kind of push. And so education is a really interesting place where we can start having these conversations and making these changes as a symbolic thing. Because education is a, is a domain where lots of people are involved. You've got kids, we've got families, we've got, you know, whole communities are forced around education. Politicians take notice of education because they want to win votes from the families and communities. So if we start doing these things in education, it can also be a bit like a beacon, a bit like a way of actually kind of, you know, hopefully persuading other sectors to also behave in similar ways. 
And also the great thing about education is that it's a global um, kind of concern. So Benjamin Bratton makes the argument that any dealing with planetary climate crisis can't be done on a national basis or a regional basis. It has to be a global effort. And education is perhaps something that can kind of be global. It's, it's a global concern. Everyone has education in, in their heads somewhere. So education can be kind of like kind of a beacon for this kind of. So I'm not saying education's at fault or education is the worst climate offender or the, the most egregious form of environmental destruction there is. But it's a great place perhaps to start having these conversations and perhaps making a difference. I want people to just look and say, oh, good look what they're doing with digital technology and education in a kind of envious way rather than in an exasperated way. So I think we can actually kind of maybe do something for good. Well, I mean, it's it's different levels because on one hand, it's it's like uses and practices and mindsets about the use of digital technology, but you know, a historical trajectory that points us in a better, more sustainable, more you know, humane future is it's there's an educational problem at the center of that that project, which is, I mean, it's a pedagogical problem, consciousness raising um learning uh developing of new human capacities and relations etc so it works at sort of both levels and i think that that's that's like a terrific place to to leave this particular conversation off and and hopefully we can pick it back up again sometime too so just want to thank you very much for your time and, and this was a, a real pleasure um i feel like i learned a lot we we're excited to have you on because we felt like this is somebody who can who can really so a lot of the questions we had today were just like, this is what like what we want to know, because we 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 feel that, you know, you're one of the um, like the way you're thinking about this issue is is you you said it's not unique. And I, I, I do appreciate that, that you said that your approach to it in terms of taking a, a sort of structural social science and constructivist approach is not necessarily unique, but there aren't that many people that know this much about uh, ed tech. So we really appreciate it. And it's been it's been a pleasure to talk to you. That's very kind. Thanks ever so much for having us on. <laughs>